Hey guys, and welcome back to the Pill Performance Podcast. I'm Jared from Team Pillar, and today I'm going to give you a rundown of what's to come in the episode. So first, we've got Damo and Scott's sleep data through their Whoop and Aura Ring. We're going to talk about how much sleep you need, how do you balance sleep while traveling, like jet lag. They talk about naps, also how to improve your sleep with food. Then they dive deep into magnesium, so an overview of what it is, how it works, why you need to pay attention to the form of magnesium you use, also what magnesium deficiency is and why it's so prominent in athletes. They dive deep into the ingredient of magnesium glycinate. Damo then talks about why he made pillow triple magnesium and, and why he wanted to make it. And finally, they talk about the concept of food first, but not food only. Anyway, I'll leave it with Damon and Scott. Hope you guys enjoy. Bye. Guys, last time we, we touched, obviously, on Scott's background. Scott is the co-founder and, and head of nutrition for Fuelin. For those of you who, who, who haven't listened, Fuelin is the, is the world's first training-based nutrition app. Uh, it syncs directly with your coaching platforms, which I think is a very, very cool feature, particularly for a lot of our, our triathlete audiences out there. So if you've got training peaks, today's plan or final surge, what you can do with Fuelin is you dial that in straight into your current platforms. And what you can do is you can actually personalize and it's a track and programming um, of nutrition alongside your training, which Scott and his team of nutritionists actually curate on a day-to-day basis, which is a very, very cool platform. But today we've got Scott back because a lot of you requested to deeper dive on sleep and particularly sleep for performance. Now, obviously we've been doing a lot of educating regarding sleep. We know that it is one of the number one things that most endurance athletes suffer with both training early in the morning and training late at night. Scott has dived so deep into this across his career and we wanted to get him back on to probably take a little bit of a deeper dive onto this topic of sleep and and obviously what that does for health and nutrition and potentially ways that we can support and obviously promote sleep as well. So, Scotty, welcome back. Thank you for your time again. It's very much appreciated on our end and and the listeners of the podcast. So thanks, mate. Thanks, Damo. Great introduction. And I think today's going to have plenty of really key takeaways and hopefully a lot of practical information. I think, you know, with all this stuff, you can get bogged down in the sort of nitty gritty and the, the science of it all. But I think what's really important for today is providing actionable takeaways for the listeners so that they can actually implement into their daily life and, and see a positive impact immediately on, on sleep and then ultimately on their health and their performance. Absolutely, mate. And how's the, um, I must say, Scott, guys, is fresh off the plane from, from a US trip. Um, we're both currently sitting in Australia, but Scott was over for Endurance Exchange. Which, Scott, where was that? That was Texas, was it? Yeah, it was in Austin, Texas, uh, the home of the barbecue. So uh, plenty of meat was consumed. How, how's the jet lag? Uh, jet lag's not too bad, actually. Uh, interestingly, I did take uh, a certain product which contained magnesium and that uh, seems to have helped the jet lag. It tends to do the... Yeah, it does help. And I, I guess like something I talk to athletes about with long haul travel is uh, getting you know, their sleep clock in order. So, you know, simple steps like going to sleep um, a couple of hours earlier or later, depending on where you're heading, but also setting your clock to your destination as soon as you step onto the plane. So, you know, usually I wouldn't be consuming caffeine in uh, at 10 o'clock at night, but in this case I had, uh, you know, a shot of coffee just to keep me up and keep me sort of awake for the first five or six hours of the flight before I uh, put the shutters down and, and slept the next seven hours. So I, all in all, it was pretty good. Nice, mate. And I thought we could start today. Let's see just how accurate your, I suppose, your summation of your sleep and jet lag is. Let's get out the sleep trackers because we both, you know, are at the moment are very dialed into this. I'm using Whoop for those people out there. Scotty, I'm going to let you know, last night I was awake for, no, these, these numbers you're not going to be very happy with me for, Scotty. Only 22% of my time in bed was in deep sleep. Last night, Scotty, Freddy had gastro, so I was up. I was in light sleep for three hours and 54 minutes, which is not great. And I only had one hour hour and 32 minutes of deep sleep. So some pretty atrocious numbers there on my end, Uh, but I have... That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, hours of sleep, six hours, 19. I mean, Whoop is saying that I need more than that, which I know I do. What do you you all look like? What are your numbers reading today? So I had eight hours, 31 minutes in bed. My total sleep time was seven hours, 53, which gave me a sleep score of 93 with Aura. Oh, nice. I don't really look at the sleep score, to be honest. I guess what I tend to look at when I'm looking at this is total amount of sleep that I got. So I did get seven hours, 53, which when we get into what 
the amount of sleep is that you should be looking for, then I certainly hit that number. In terms of like my REM, I had an hour 40 and my deep sleep was an hour nine. I'm, I'm pretty efficient. My sleep's pretty good. Uh, I tend to, you know, fall asleep pretty quickly and I tend to stay uh, stay asleep as well. So uh, luckily my, my sleep certainly is something that I don't have to worry about, which I know a lot of athletes and, and people in general do have issues with sleep. And uh, again, hopefully some of the information we give today will help them with that. Okay, nice. Well, I've got some work to do tonight. Um, I'll be in bed early, which is going to be <laughs> tough to do as well. Anyway, Matt, let's dive into it. I want to start right at the top. Let's start very, very high level sleep and health. Talk to me about the importance and the correlation there. I think it's a really, really important place to start this chat today. Yeah, and I, I think that's probably a good thing to think about is like a lot of this is correlation the way the studies are done. But again, when you see enough correlation, you can start to make, you know, decent decisions and decision making around that uh, based on the volume of evidence that is is sort of accumulating. So I think, look, from a simple standpoint, if you get more than seven hours sleep per night, that's not time in bed. And that's why I said I was in bed. What did I say? I was in bed for eight and a half hours, but got seven hours, 50. So I was awake for at least 40 odd minutes of the time I'm in bed. So it's time asleep, which is important. But if you can get more than seven hours total sleep per night, and that can be consistent across your, your lifespan, then you're going to, it has a positive association on health. So reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, reduced risk of diabetes, reduced risk of cognitive decline, i.e. Alzheimer's. One of the questions I do want to talk to you about, because it's, I suffered from this as an athlete, was, was travel and around sleep impacting how and when I would be able to stay on, on, on a nutrition regime. Can you dive in and talk about that potentially and even touch on those traveling, which a lot of us do. Um, can we talk about, we know now how sleep obviously is vital for overall health, but let's dive in a little bit more specifically on performance and touch on sleep and how that impacts nutrition and potentially, you know, dietary patterning as well. Yeah. So again, correlation, not necessarily causation, but again, enough studies are, are existing to show the impact that sleep has on nutrition. So you touch on like, you know, probably poor sleep when traveling. So excessively short sleep is going to have a negative impact on dietary patterns. So what you'll see is when you have short sleep, you're going to have increased intake of calories, uh, probably poor decision making. And ultimately, those individuals who have poor sleep, uh, oh, sorry, short sleep will tend to be more likely to be overweight or obese. Now, why is that when you have shorter sleep, you tend to have increased uh, snacking, you tend to have increased number of meals. And again, as we said, those choices of those meals tend to be worse as well. So when you have an increased frequency of intake and you have an increased uh, total amount of calories, you start to see the problem because ultimately the caloric uh, intake is going to be a surplus relative to the expenditure. And as we know, uh, based on physics, that if you are in a caloric surplus, you will tend to put on weight. And mate, when you talk about timing and excessively short sleeps, can you dial in, is there, do, do you promote or have any, any kind of, I suppose, way of helping those that love a, love a nap in the afternoon? And I know a lot of triathletes, a lot of, a lot of the pros particularly will often have, and I know Jan Fredino had a very, very clever little 20 minute sleep and I was with him recently took, you know, when you talk about napping, is there anything that you could see from a nutritional perspective and timing perspective that can actually benefit those shorter bursts of sleep. Um, you know, we all hear about the, the espresso nap that um, a lot of the cyclists take when they're on the bus as well. They'll have an espresso, go to bed for 15 minutes and then get on with an afternoon session. Is there anything there that you can recommend around timing to help promote long or short bursts of sleep? In terms of that actual nap? Is that what you're referring to? Oh, look, I mean, napping is a very, it's an effective strategy. Yeah, I, I think napping is an important one to bring up. Yeah, look, I think napping is an important strategy for those individuals who do struggle with total amount of sleep, whether it's because of family issues at home, like you mentioned, and then having to get up early for training. So napping can be an effective strategy to get increased amounts of sleep. I guess it's important just to, to recognize that a lot of your total sleep is based around a circadian rhythm. And that is going to be impacted. Like if you're getting, if you're getting up very early in the morning, REM sleep is most likely going to be impacted 
because that's based around that circadian rhythm with majority of REM sleep, my understanding coming in around that sort of six o'clock onwards. So between six and seven is where a lot of that REM sleep will occur. So for those individuals who are tracking their sleep and they're seeing that their REM is often very small in terms of the percentage of sleep cycle, it could be because they're just getting up so early and the ability to impact that may ultimately be, you know, very hard to change. And if you, you do you yourself, do you, do you experiment with, do you, you know, do you have time for naps these days? Do you do the old, you know, do you do a, you know, a shot of caffeine into a nap? Because obviously there is that correlation we know and anyone who's listening to Matt Walker out there on his While We Sleep podcast knows that napping can be incredibly effective for an energy burst in the afternoon and particularly the, the suppression that caffeine can provide as well can benefit that. Do you, do you, you know, do you recommend that for some of your athletes as well? Well, I don't do it personally. I think, look, if, if someone wants to nap and they can effectively nap and they require that in order to then perform in their next, if they've got a second session in the day, and if they have the luxury of being able to uh, take a nap during the day, then certainly I would, I would certainly advocate it. I think any time you're going into this state of, you know, sleep, it is going to be restorative to the body. And that, that's the whole point of it. I think when you listen to Matt Walker, you know, talk about it. Yeah, you know, sleep is still poorly understood, but I think it's now being recognized, you know, those different states of sleep with deep sleep being predominantly where the physical repair occurs versus the REM sleep later in the day is more about uh, memory and, and, and thought promotion and, and cognition and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do remember there was a study going around where there was, there was a, I can't remember exactly where it was from, but they were particularly talking about high-skilled, high-skilled based sports. So trying to time when the highest level or, you know, the session of the day and, I don't know, Scotty, let's choose, let's choose basketball, for example, when the particular element of, well, it's a highly skilled sport no matter what session they're doing, but let's just choose, you know, let's choose an element when they're just doing a very close skill shooting exercise. There was a really interesting study, um, and I will find it and put it in the show notes, but it was around trying to max, maximise that REM and cognitive um, period of the day where the body and the mind is at the sharpest in with the highest element of skill part of the day in terms of that and they tried to match up the training and how that would look from an outcome perspective as well and they had some pretty profound profound results um, and I actually think it was on basketball because it's so measurable obviously and it's baskets shot and scored so um, that that there I think if anyone is to, um, keen to see it we'll try and find that study but it's a really interesting one that can show that correlation between when you put a high skill exercise in a part of the day that potentially the mind and you know the mind and our cognitive state isn't as it's I suppose most sharp it can definitely have some some effects that that would be quite interesting to some people so guys that does cover probably from a very high level how you know the different periods of sleep can impact performance and um Scotty you, you touched on the REM there you touched on the difference between what that does in deep sleep you know you you mentioned the word you know restorative Particularly, can you dive into that and maybe go a little bit deeper around what you were thinking in regards to that and how that would potentially differ from REM sleep and, and how an athlete might be able to work between the two and think about them, particularly those that are tracking them. I think those that have got access to that trackable, like if I wake up as, as you know, as, as not a professional athlete anymore and my deep sleep is really poor like it was last night, you know, essentially what my, you know, what my whoop app is telling me that I should take it pretty easy that day. You know, you, do you fully buy into potentially that having to be the way in which you program or, or there's just clever ways you can move around it? Well, I mean, are you saying if your sleep is poor, should you take it easy for that day when you're getting told that? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I was more thinking if my deep sleep was poor, if we now correlate deep sleep with physical recovery, for whatever reason, me personally, at the moment, I just can't seem to get enough level of deep sleep. And my whoop is screaming out at me every day to get this, this stuff sorted. And I'm, I'm trying my best to try and do that with, with some strategies. But yeah, I mean, it, it, essentially, I'm always in the red and not essentially recovered to, to start to be physical. I mean, what are some of the ways that, you know, that sleep can be, you know, can be thought about from an athlete perspective, because it can, you know, it can obviously work people up um, into a negative state when it comes to performance. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you'd ever stop an athlete from uh, training or, or playing just based on their, their stages of sleep <laughs> yeah, and their luck. deep sleep. So yeah, I wouldn't be doing that. I think again, to take a step back, like we talked about the impact of sleep on nutrition. It's like, what's the impact of nutrition on sleep? And again, a lot of this is correl correlation, not necessarily causal, but we do see that increased consumption 
of fruit and vegetables will have a significant significant impact on quality of sleep. So it has an impact on quality of sleep. It also has an impact on duration of sleep. So those individuals who adhere to a consistent pattern of eating at least five to seven serves of vegetables and fruits per day will tend to have reported better quality of sleep and better duration of sleep. So again, you take a step back and you go, well, how, how do I try and improve my deep sleep? There you go. Yeah, like really bump up your fruit and vegetable consumption. What does increasing your fruit and vegetable consumption always do? It increases like the micronutrient intake. But secondly, it probably removes a heap of the shit. It probably removes a heap of the products that could be negatively impacting sleep as well because they don't have any nutritional value. So I think everyone jumps in and thinks, oh, how do I, what do I need to do? Have I, I need to do this, I need to do that. But actually sometimes it's really simple and it's straight in front of you. It's like, like, you simply eat more fruit and veg. And I know that sounds incredibly simplistic, but I can tell you now anecdotally and also reading this research, like anecdotally with the athletes where, you know, in Fuel In, we're recommending six serves of veggies a day and athletes are like sort of, you know, half complaining, half joking, you know, they've never eaten so many vegetables. But then when we track subjective well-being and we track their quality of sleep, how they rate it, we see at least an 8% increase in that metric. Now I've heard figures from Whoop and I think Aura have put thrown it out that they're seeing increased figures of 2%. And, you know, our CEO, Jonathan was saying, oh, look, we're seeing increased figures of up to 8%. And I'm like, 8% oh, is not very significant, is it? And then he obviously said what was happening with Whoop and they're reporting a 2% increase and getting excited about that. I, I think there is a lot more to this. And if you can get individual athletes actually focusing on what they're doing day to day with fruit and vegetable intake, you will see positive impacts on your sleep metrics. It's not sexy. It's not cool. Like obviously you're in a supplements company. It's like maybe not as cool as like, you know, taking a product um, like the triple magnesium, which ultimately can help for people who do have sleep issues, do have a real di dialed in nutrition um, sort of program. But at the most basic level, just increasing fruit and vegetables, as I said, five to seven serves, you know, and, and people are like, oh, you know, but do, does everyone do that? Do I do that? Yeah. That maybe that's why my sleep's good. I don't know. Maybe I just don't get too stressed about it. But, yeah. Some, mate, definitely know, something that, to take in there. Yeah. Like it's so cool that something's so easy. Yeah. Again, looking through the research, like the Mediterranean diet, is always referenced as has a, having a positive impact on sleep, sleep quality, sleep duration. I don't know about you, but I look at the Mediterranean diet and I'm like, well, it's just the diet we had growing up. It had plenty of good animal products, i.e. meat um, and fish. We ate a lot of fruit. We ate a lot of vegetables. We had whole grains. We had some dairy. Um, we didn't eat a lot of processed foods. I would say that was probably the typical country Australian diet that I grew up on. Yeah. And it, again, it's correlated to much better health, isn't it? The Mediterranean diet is talked about a lot in all aspects of health. And in particular, if we're talking sleep, again, the Mediterranean diet is referenced. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, plenty of, I mean, every time I've spent a lot of time in the med, plenty of tomato as well. And I'm mean, knowing up growing up as an Aussie kid, every, how I think, I think one third of every salad we ever had growing up, we had tomato in it. So plenty of antioxidants in there as well. But mate, you did touch on it. And one of the questions that were, came thick and fast from our, a lot of our customers, a lot of our listeners um, was obviously to do around magnesium, a topic and a product that we have released that is now just showing some phenomenal results and like overwhelmingly positive results for athletes now around the world and very soon to be in North America, which we're really excited about mid-March. So for, for those of you who have been waiting, those in, in the States and Canada, I appreciate the patience. But we want to talk about magnesium because this is one of the things that Scott and his team do promote and, and obviously endorse for their athletes to particularly the ones that firstly have shown, you know, evidential need for magnesium, but also those that are looking to try and solve for sleep for performance as well. And we're going to dive into it with Scott today because a lot of people did want to hear from him regarding this, Scotty. So first things, mate, let's, let's cover it off because I, I mean, people get sick of me talking about it, even though I, I love it. It's, it's very much probably the very first thing we need to explain is magnesium and the different forms of it, because that there, without a doubt, is probably the biggest miseducation 
and therefore biggest misformulation in products when it comes to magnesium, what they're actually being consumed to try and solve for. So let's dive into it. Let, let's talk about the different forms of magnesium. Or even before we do that, let's just talk about magnesium at a very high level and sleep. Why, why when you've got athletes to talk to you about sleep, that magnesium immediately comes up? Yeah, so magnesium, without getting into the weeds of this, but magnesium is crucial for the formation of melatonin via the serotonin pathway. So without magnesium, without vitamin B5, you can't, uh, serotonin can't go through that transformation into melatonin. So I think that's a really important point. If you are deficient in magnesium, then you probably are limiting the ability to actually make melatonin, which ultimately will help you sleep. So I think that's a really important aspect or consideration for people out there to have. I think the other thing, if we're talking about athletes and we're talking about performance, athletes are more susceptible to magnesium deficiency due to their increased utilization during exercise. And again, that's a really important point, okay? Magnesium, just as a general overview, is crucial in over 80% of all metabolic functions, okay? It's involved in over 350 enzymatic functions or processes. So like you start to get an understanding of how important magnesium is as a general element, okay? But the difference, as you said, is there are different types of uh, magnesiums and how they're absorbed in the gut is what I think you're getting at in terms of like, what are the crucial aspects? Because you have something like magnesium oxide, about 5% is absorbed. And then you have that other 95%, which acts as a laxative. So hence why, you know, ultimately, if you take the wrong form of magnesium and you take it in high doses, people will more often than not complain of GI complaints in particular, you know, that laxative effect. Um, that's why I like magne- Epsom salts as well. They've got magnesium sulfate in it. It's a very effective laxative if it's taken in large amounts or large volumes. So I think that is a very important consideration for athletes when they're considering what types of magnesium they're going to be consuming. And so, guys, what, what's got there is I'll highlight as well because we get it's a commonly asked question. Why, I suppose, the pillar formulation does differ potentially from magnesiums that have been used previously. The largest reason being is 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 we are targeting an athletic consumer base. We're targeting a performance outcome. And as Scotty touched upon the very first top topic there, Scotty, um, on the point, you said athletes are more susceptible to magnesium deficiencies, and it makes a lot of sense because of the increased utilization of magnesium during exercise obviously what goes out you know what goes out must come back in that there from a high level is is a big reason why a lot of athletes now are looking for different formulations and need to look for different formulations if they are looking for magnesium for say recovery for sleep promotion Um, and that's really important and i think if for those athletes out there scotty like let's dive into a little bit about uh, potentially about how do you know if you're deficient in magnesium like you know you talk about blood testing what are athletes meant to be looking for if, if you are going to look down the path of potentially going and doing some testing on that? Um, and what are the thoughts on that with you and your athletes? Yeah, I think blood testing would make sense if you're worried about uh, your magnesium status. So red cell magnesium testing is what you have to get. So serum magnesium test, which is the general one that most doctors will order, generally won't give you a indication whether you are deficient or not. You want to get what's called red cell magnesium And if it's less than 1.65 millimoles per litre, you are effectively deficient. And just back to the other point, Damo, just before we jump into that a bit more, I think when we talked about athletes and the utilisation of magnesium, we're talking about a lot of metabolic functions and that's why magnesium is involved. A lot of people get confused and think that an electrolyte has to have magnesium in it. An electrolyte with magnesium is useless. I'm just going to throw it out there and you can talk to Alan McCubbin all you want about this, but the, the, in, if you're taking an electrolyte with magnesium in it and you think that's going to actually help you in terms of hydration status and cramping and that, it's probably not going to be the effective way of taking magnesium. Your electrolyte ultimately is going to be around the sodium content and total fluid balance with a few other things. But in terms of magnesium, you're taking it in a specific formulation and for a specific purpose. And I wouldn't say, again, if you think of the laxative effect as well, and you look at most forms of magnesium in an electrolyte, most of them have magnesium oxide, which you put two and two together and you're like, no wonder you got runner's gut or something like that. So I think think that is really important just to touch on in terms of where your magnesium is coming from as well. 
Absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the largest education pieces we do around is around timing of utilizing because, you know, obviously formulation ingredient quality from a micro perspective, super important, but it is then for us, we are going to, we're trying to educate a lot on timing, when to time to use your micronutrients. And we know magnesium is near the most essential micronutrient for endurance athletes when it comes to recovery and sleep. And that is why what you've just said there is a, is a perfect example. We really try to educate that you want to use magnesium, particularly a triple, you know, triple magnesium by pillar. It's in a controlled environment. So while we recommend have it before bed, control how much liquid you're having, if you are having it with, potentially if you're having it with water, if you're having it in tablet form, be quite controlled and deliberate about when you're having it. Some people like to, you know, book in their days with one one tablet in the morning, one in the evening. But, you know, it's not one of those ones where you just chuck a scoop and a bit or whatever or grab a teaspoon and throw it in. The dosage amounts are really deliberate because when you do formulate at a certain level, you can actually really be able to dial in on the need state being solved and to not actually make sure that your magnesium has been had during training or racing where you don't really get a clear understanding on how much you're being consumed because things are pretty, you know, things are pretty fast paced in those environments. Try and take this stuff in a controlled environment and you'll get potentially get different outcomes as well. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And look, I think if we go back to your question about deficiency and testing, I think the blood test is important. And I think this was really highlighted so there was a paper that came out and it looked at an eight year analysis of magnesium status in elite international track and field athletes. So this was the British Olympic and Paralympic team. They had 192 athletes, okay, over eight years. 510 samples from 192 athletes were included in the study. On at least one of those blood tests during the time, 22% of all the athletes were clinically deficient. These are elite international Olympic athletes and Paralympic athletes. So as we said, and a deficiency is regarded as less than 1.65 millimoles, okay, of red cell magnesium. The average red cell magnesium concentration was 1.34. So that was the average across the entire eight years. They're all technically deficient. Like, and then you go into it deeper and they're like significantly lower in female athletes, significantly lower in female black and mixed race athletes. So then you start thinking, okay, am I one of those? Obviously, are you an endurance athlete in track and field? Interestingly, it was higher in athletes with cerebral palsy. Now, why that is, I, I don't know, but very interesting. Another interesting fact from this study, which is a long time, and I get it, like there's probably a lot of confounding factors in it and people want to rip it apart, but athletes with a history of tendon issues, Achilles patella, patella in, injury, I can't even speak, history of Achilles and patella tendon injuries, they had significantly lower magnesium status than the average. So again, like start to do like a little bit of like, okay, where do I sit on the baseline? Where's my red cell magnesium? What type of athlete am I? What's my gender? What's my race? Do I have a history of injury? Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm tick, 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 tick. Okay. What are you going to do about it? Then you're going to look at the forms of magnesium you're doing. And then again, like talking about the absorption of it, something like, I, I think it's brilliant that you're including like magnesium glycinate. I think like nobody's doing it. And it's like, why not? It's like, it is magnesium bound to glycine. Glycine is an amino acid. So the body absorbs this really, really well. Okay. So it's like taking up, what did I say? Magnesium oxide is like 5% absorption. Magnesium glycinate is 95% absorption. Like you only have to do the math on that and you're like, oh, okay. So that's pretty cool. So you're going to get minimal laxative effect immediately. It's also like you've got the glycine. So glycine's also been shown to have a calming effect on the nervous system. So, you know, whilst you're taking magnesium glycinate in its form for the magnesium, potentially the glycine is also having a positive effect as well. And that's why, you know, the TGA is allowing like, you know, when you take a product like this, it has a calming effect it improves sleeplessness or improves your ability to sleep. Like that's why there is research to support this. And that's why, you know, they're happy to give that tick of, you know, approval to a product like magnesium glycinate. And I, I think it's brilliant that you're using a product and anecdotally, like I can think of a number of athletes who have used your product either with travel or just restless legs or sleep issues. And they have sleep issues. They're not just taking it for the sake of taking it and they're having a positive impact. Uh, they're seeing positive effects, subjective positive effects from it. 
And I think that's that's super to see, you know, when it's a targeted approach. And guys, I'll, I'll thanks for that, Scotty. I mean, we, we worked for a long time trying to decode a lot of sports science studies on the triple magnesium formulation. The bliss glycinate or glycinate dihydrate, if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, has, has amazing um, clinical studies regarding the benefits for sleep. And for me, one of the things I've found with talking to a lot of athletes, my own teammates, is the fact that a lot of them were using magnesium for sleep, yet the magnesiums that were being prescribed to them that were currently on the market were being used with different forms of magnesium, you know, three and eight, malate, again, all have and serve different functions. You know, as we've said, 320 enzymatic processes and each of the magnesiums cover different ones. To be really clear about what you're trying to solve for allows you to then decode which products and which magnesium forms you need to look for. We just, what we did was we made sure that we selected the, the magnesiums that correlated to sleep, muscular recovery. Those were what we were trying to solve for because that athletically is what athletes were looking for. And that's been the biggest difference and the biggest reason that we've found so many positive results now with, with the product. What you said there, and I think it's really important as well, one of the, the other education pieces for magnesium is regards to that ratio of absorbability. And, and, and Scotty, let's dive in just a little bit between elemental magnesium and activated magnesium because, guys, they are very, very different to what you find on the back of the label. Now, if you're in parts of the world, um, Europe and Australia, you have to break both forms of it down. So you will have a, an activated element of magnesium, uh, which is the actual milligramage of the form of magnesium. Now, you then have what's called an elemental version. So what that breaks down to meaning in uh, you know, accumulated magnesium. Now, what you want to look for is obviously the level, not in the entirety of, you want to look for a combination of the types of magnesium you're looking for, obviously the highest quality, the better. And you then want to make sure you're looking for the activated versions of those because the unique thing that it's a bit of a trick in the industry that what Scotty was saying about a magnesium such as oxide, it is 5% absorbed, 95% basically wasted. Now, what that magnesium form does actually, it has an incredibly high ratio of one to one elemental. So a brand or, or a product could have, let's say 300 milligrams of oxide magnesium, that would translate to near close to 300 milligrams of elemental magnesium. You're basically getting 300 milligrams of not much. So as essential, when you look at something like a bliss glycinate, it's a one to eight ratio. So our product, for example, has 400 milligrams of bliss glycinate magnesium, a huge amount, but correlated, it only has 50 milligrams of elemental. So that's how you've got to think about it. Quality over quantity um, is a really mis misconceived like idea on, on when it comes to magnesium labeling that I think a lot of people come unstuck with as well, Scotty. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better. I mean, you, you've only got to do the math on what you were saying then. So with a the magnesium oxide, you'll get about 15 milligrams of actual uh, magnesium, whereas your 400 milligrams of bisglycinate, you're going to get 40 milligrams. So it, it's like, it's just not, it's not apples and apples, it's apples and pears. And, and I think it is really important for individual consumers and it's not limited to magnesium. I mean, you've only got to look on the back of any of these products, fish oils or, you know, any of the nootropics or anything like that. And they'll have these outlandish claims on the front of the packet. But then when you actually get into it, a lot of it is dry concentrate and things like that. It's not the actual extract and the actual bioavailability amount. So it is really important to educate yourself on what are you actually getting from the supplement that you're taking as opposed to what is written in very flashy letters. Mate, absolutely. And, and just on that, Damo, I think like, yes, we are talking about some supplements here, but I think if we take a step back again, you know, back to what we were talking about, like fruit and veg should be your primary source of all these micronutrients. And I think we're all in agreement on that. You know, best sources of magnesium, whole grains, leafy greens, low fat milk, pulses, beans, nuts, things like cashews and almonds. The issue being now, and this is proposed and, you know, I think more and more research is coming out about this is about the quality of the soil that this fruit and veg has been grown in, unfortunately, is deplete of magnesium. And I think this is where for lower quality standard of fruit and vegetables, this could become an issue for individuals who are even consuming fruit and veg because the quality of the magnesium within it could be reduced. So it is just something to think about as well, but from a very high level perspective, absolutely focus on, you know, as I said, five to seven for, uh, serves of fruit and veg 
as a, as a pillar, as a starting point. And then I think if you get your red cell blood, uh, red cell, mag, uh, red cell, red blood cell magnesium tested, and you are deficient, then look at, okay, are you doing everything in your daily nutrition to say, I should be higher, and then looking at supplementation and targeted supplementation to improve that. And so to take, take the words out of your mouth from a presentation we did a little while ago, Scotty, whole, whole food first, not whole food only. Is that it? Correct. Uh, food first, not food only. Food first, yeah. not food only. That's and a Scott Tindall. Well, I'd like to say yeah. I, I coined it, but actually I'll have to give credit to Professor Graham Close. Uh, and he wrote, he wrote a wonderful wow. research paper on this. That's um, kind of you. Yeah, I know. It's not often I give credit to others when I've stolen it. But, um, you know, if you go on PubMed and just search that title, Food First Yet Not Food Only, you'll be able to read that paper. And it, it gives a great example. I think it does reference magnesium. It certainly references fish oils, which uh, I know we'll talk about at another time. But, um, you know, it's not always food first. There are times, especially for an athletic population, where supplementation can complement your diet and bring about profound impact, positive impact as well. So guys, to wrap that up, whole grains, leafy greens, low fat milk, Scotty, that was right. Yep. Not, not normal, yep. but not full fat, low fat milk. Yep. Um, pulses was one. Um, can yep. you explain Beans. to me, is that, a, is that a North American term? What's pulse? I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. What is things that? Things like lentils. lentils? And okay, things lentils. Like that. You don't know pulses? Okay. Come on. No, what, where, where, where is, is that? Is that is that lentils in 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 American speak? Is yeah, it? I think so. I always thought it was just termed pulses. Okay. Pulses and beans and yeah. lentils slash 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 for yeah. everyone. Um, and then our nuts. Any particular nuts? So you've got you mentioned cashews and almonds. They we should cashews and almonds. Okay, get into them. Perfect. All pretty all pretty standard foods that yeah all pretty standard foods that you can put on a plate. And guys, the the fuel in program obviously runs a traffic light program on this stuff as well. And Scotty, do you guys dialing back into fuel in for a little bit? For your athletes there, do you do you does the traffic light program dive in? I suppose from micro nutritional element on that traffic light program, or is that mainly based around the the more of the macro side and, and what you're trying to fill the plates with? And then you can you, you've obviously got diet you know you've got diet recommendations in there for people that do you know obviously a, a trending on on a magnesium deficiency or something like that. Yeah, so the the traffic light system is more based around the macronutrients. So that's in particular carbohydrates. Uh, so periodizing the carbohydrate uh, quantity and the quality around the the type of session that the athlete is performing. So lower intensity, you know, shorter duration, you're probably going to get what we term a red meal, which could be lower amounts of carbohydrates, probably predominantly in vegetables and fruits. And then you go in through the yellow, which is around 50 grams of carbs, and then green into 100 grams of carbs. And with the green, you can certainly still consume whole foods, things like potato, sweet potato, and root vegetables. But you're probably moving more into things like rice, some breads, some grains, some of those higher glycemic type carbohydrates to not only provide you with the amount of carbohydrate that you require, but probably overall reducing total fiber intake to allow you to get the, the total volume of food in, which can become problematic for larger athletes and and even smaller athletes who are being you know certainly when you're getting up into eight to ten grams per kilo body weight of carbohydrate consumption in a day for you damo that's probably like what uh, two kilos or so <laughs> well, no, no comment on that one hey scotty that's at 40 minutes mate um we know the attention spans probably probably taper off after this but mate thank you so much again we had a lot of questions come in to our platform but if Anyone out there does want to touch base with Scotty or his team at Fuel In. Scotty, best platform, maybe go direct message on Instagram. It tends to be the, the easiest way for people these days. Yeah, I think either Instagram, so get Fuel In, or just go to our website, which is fuelin.com, um, and there's a connect with us or a contact us, and you can do that. Uh, coach at fuelin.com will also hit us. So you can reach us in multiple uh, manners. Fantastic. And likewise, guys, if, if you want to come and chat to us at Pillar, anything that we've we've spoken about here, you'd like to know some more information, 
look, I always recommend Facebook, Instagram is usually the best way. Jared, who is producing this podcast in the background, will be there to answer um, and direct any any kind of inquiries you have. But I hope today's been informative, guys. Scotty, again, I'm going to enjoy having you on for that for that next session when we talk about Amiga, which we are looking forward to a lot. Uh, that was the second most requested topic from the micronutrition uh, family of products that we've got that we want to talk about Amiga. So, guys, we'll have Scotty back on shortly. Thank you very much for joining. Um, if you've enjoyed it, please, we would love a, a review on Apple or Spotify podcasts um, or wherever you're listening to this. So see you guys next time, Scotty. Thanks again. Thanks, Damo. Thanks for having me.